We come now to the final lecture in this module entitled Common Grace and Fearless Anthropomorphism. In a previous module, I spoke for some time about Bavink and Van Til on the doctrine of immutability and its relation to anthropomorphic language. I'm going to assume some basic familiarity with that lecture and with an essay that I have included for your reading entitled Locating the Mystery, Bavink and Van Til on Immutability and Anthropomorphism. I want to define anthropomorphism as understood first by Bavink and then expanded and fine-tuned by Van Til because it provides the backdrop for Van Til's discussion of God as our concrete universal. Uh, it provides the context in terms of which we conceive of the relation of the Creator in His relation, the revelation of the Creator in His relation to the creature. To define anthropomorphism or anthropomorphic language, we can say this, anthropomorphic language in the Bible renders the acts of the self-contained, immutable, and impassable triune God in language and concepts borrowed from the dependent, mutable, and passable created order. And so the relationship in view is that which is immutable, impassable, and eternal on the one side, to that which is mutable, passable, and temporal on the other side. And anthropomorphic language anthropomorphic language takes the categories of the creature, the mutable, the passable, the temporal categories from the created order, and that language depicts these acts of God that fall in time, that fall in space. In Bavink's famous summary on the matter, and to give you the briefest of review of Bavink, the Bible's teaching as a whole, according to Bavink, prohibits ascribing change to God by an appeal to anthropomorphic language, R.D. 2, 158. And the briefest summary that I can give you in terms of one quote from Bavink that I'll make comments on, we can look at R.D. 2, 158 and 159. Bavink, R.D. 2, 158 and 59. Speaking of this particular uh, relation of the immutable God to the mutable creature and the way the immutable acts of God are rendered in the forms of of the creature, he says this. In fact, God's incomprehensible greatness by and by implication the glory of the Christian confession of God are precisely that though in immutable in himself, God can call mutable creatures into being, though eternal in himself, God can nevertheless enter into time and though immeasurable in himself, he can fill every cubic inch of space with his presence. In other words, though he himself is absolute being, God can give to transient beings a distinct existence of their own. In God's eternity, there exists not a moment of time. In his immensity, there is not a speck of space. In his being, there is no sign of becoming. Conversely, it is God who posits the creature, eternity which posits time, immensity which posits space, being which posits becoming, immutability which posits change. And here's a key quote. There is nothing intermediate between these two classes of categories. A deep chasm separates God's being from all creatures. Three points by way of summary before we move to Van Til. First, the triune God does not change 
in any way as he condescends to relate to image-bearing creatures in the work of special creation. The condescension of God in the special acts of creation and providence reveals the living and immutable triune God. God has not changed in his covenantal relation to the creature. Malachi 3.6, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. This text in Malachi 3.6 speaks of God in his concrete covenantal relation to creation. So Malachi 3.6 becomes a central text that Bavink deploys to make this distinction. The immutability of God in his covenantal condescension grounds the religious hope of his people. If God voluntarily limited himself, took to himself new qualities, or engaged in self-modification, religious hope would disappear. Secondly, a text that Bavink appeals to quite regularly is James 1.17. The Father does not change like shifting shadows, even as he gives every good and perfect gift. The work of special creation and the act of special providence in covenant does not introduce personal change into the Trinity. The Father does not change in his relation to creation. He doesn't change in covenantal condescension. The Father does use it mutable, created media to give perfect gifts, but he is not mutable like the media he deploys. Second point, Bavink insists there is, quote-unquote, nothing intermediate between God and the creature. So when we draw these two lines here, there is nothing intermediate. There's no third class of properties. There is God and all of his inexhaustible fullness and his attributes. There is the creature and the attributes that God gives the creature in creation. And there's not a third thing. There's nothing intermediate. Put it this way before. God as God relates to man as man. And the relational activity of the former, God, is rendered in terms and concepts borrowed from the relational activity of the latter man. God does not take to himself intermediate properties of a mutable and composite character that somehow enable the relation. That's Bavik's point. Third, and briefly, the mutable created phenomena deployed by God in his revelation in Theophanies and Christophanies ought never to be ascribed to God as attributes or properties taken on by him in relation to creation. This distinction is critical, and it helps us understand what Van Til is going to say. While God uses created media in his condescension, whether it's before the fall or after the fall, we cannot say that the created media deployed somehow becomes attributes of God. We cannot confuse those categories. That would not only deny his immutability, but also his simplicity. He would be taking on new qualities, new attributes he did not otherwise have. God appropriates all sorts of created, mutable media in his revelation, all the while remaining the immutable and simple triune God in Revelation. To put it in a way that captures historic, reformed language, the triune God remains pure act without modification in his self-revelation, even though he reveals himself in the forms of potentiality found in the created order. Therein lies the mystery. That is the locus of the mystery. That is the mystery when we think of the relation between the immutable and passable eternal triune God, the mutable, passable temporal creature, and the way that the categories from the latter render the actions of the former.
Boving's denial of anything intermediate between the self-contained, simple, and immutable creator and the dependent, composite, mutable creature makes the point crisply. A third class of properties simply doesn't exist. Now that moves us to Van Til. Van Til and fearless anthropomorphism. This is definitely a phrase that sums up Van Til's conception of this creator-creature relation and the way that Scripture reveals the being and the works of God. He says in a few places, and I'm going to read the, the places that they occur, this phrase occurs in Common Grace in the Gospel, and then explain it just a bit, and then add a quotation we have never considered in our course before and expound on it in some detail. Van Til termed his approach fearless anthropomorphism, and he set that doctrine directly over against all forms of correlativism. Listen to the quotes. These are from Common Grace in the Gospel 94, 93, and 73. First, we shall not fear to be boldly anthropomorphic to begin with, because we have in our doctrine of the ontological trinity and temporal creation cut ourselves loose once and for all from correlativism between God and man. Quote two, a fearless anthropomorphism based on the doctrine of the ontological trinity rather than abstract reasoning on the basis of a metaphysical or epistemological correlativism should control our concepts all along the line. Third, we need at this point to be fearlessly anthropomorphic. Now before we tackle and expound specifically what the fearless dimension involves. We need to first understand what Van Til means by anthropomorphism, rejecting every form of correlativism. Van Til argued in the defense of the faith along these lines. My doctrine of God, he says, quote, has self-consciously been set in opposition to all forms of non-Christian thought which compromise or deny the self-contained character of God by thinking of him as correlative to the universe. Correlativism teaches, as you remember, either that God changes in his relation to creation or that he is in some way determined by his relation to creation. Changed or determined, mutable or passable. The two texts that Van Til cites in contrast to correlativism, you might not be surprised, are Malachi 3.6, James 1.17, echoing Bavink on this very matter. He says, quote, We speak of the immutability of God. Naturally, God does not and cannot change, since there is nothing besides his own eternal being on which he depends. Scripture text? Malachi 3.6, James 1.17. The two texts Van Til introduces here include redemptive covenantal relation, Malachi 3.6, creational relation of a triune person, the Father, uh, James 1.17. So Van Til denies correlativism by affirming that God remains essentially, personally, and in his covenantal relation, immutable at every point. And he says this explicitly, the attributes of God are not to be thought of as otherwise than aspects of the one simple being. The attributes of God are not characteristics God has developed gradually. They're fundamental to his being. No third thing, no third class of attributes. God does not take on new attributes in relating to creation. He does not have, uh, uh, he does not assume them. He does not generate them. And they do not develop over time. In Van Til's theology of God's relation to the world, there is no correlativism between God and man 
at any point in the relation. So whatever Van Til says about anthropomorphic language, it must be formulated to deny correlativity any assertion of mutual change between God and the creature. Now, I want to introduce a quotation from IST, page 200, where Van Til says something more about anthropomorphic language. And this sets us up to address contemporary failures to understand Van Til's teaching on this point. Failures that exist among his ostensible heirs from what I will call the first generation of Van Til scholars, namely Frame and Oliphant. The rather extensive quote I'm going to give you is from IST, Intro to Systematic Theology, page 200. Quote, to speak of the limitation of God is to deny his absoluteness and therewith to deny God himself. If we were to speak of God's limitation, we should have to speak of self-limitation. And we would have to begin with his self-limitation at the creation of the world. The result would be a hiding of God instead a revealing of him. Pantheism has constantly sought to wedge itself into the church by this avenue. Since modernism is ready to enter into the church via the old pantheistic doctrines, that is more the reason not to yield an inch on this point. The Bible uses anthropomorphic names of God constantly, but nowhere presents a limited deity. End of quote. Now let me make five comments on this section. First, Van Til affirms that any form of limitation in God, voluntary or otherwise, as he relates to creation, would amount to a denial of the absolute triune God. Remember Van Til said earlier from Defense of the Faith, God does not and cannot change. His argument would be that if God engages in some form of self-limitation, he would become something other than the absolute, self-contained, immutable, triune God. He would increase or decrease. If he increases in any way, then he would not be already infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being wisdom and power. If God were to decrease any way, in any way, then he would lose his absolute and self-contained identity in the new relation. Thus, Van Til says that to speak of the limitation of God in any way, in his mode of being or in his mode of knowledge as he reveals himself in creation, to affirm the self-limitation of God in any way denies his pure actuality and therewith denies God himself. A limited God amounts to a God other than who is revealed in Scripture and confessed in the Reformed creeds and confessions. Second, Van Til specifically targets the idea of self-limitation that on this heretical hypothesis occurs at the creation of the world and says that it would be a quote-unquote hiding of God rather than a revealing of him. Now, Van Til's point needs a bit of clarification so that we do not miss it. Self-limitation not only denies the absoluteness of God the Creator, but it denies His revelation in history. Reflect on that for a moment. The God of revelation, according to Bavink and Van Til, is the absolute triune Creator. To speak of a self-limitation that occurs at the creation of the world winds up hiding the immutability of God, winds up hiding the true God from us, because it would be some God other than this God who relates to creation. To speak of divine self-limitation in creation entails 
that something or someone other than the Ase God has revealed himself. Now, with that being said, and bringing into view anthropomorphism, that's not to say that revelation is not accommodating. It's not to say revelation is, is um, unaccommodative. God discloses his glory in the mutable forms of the creature. God accommodates to his creatures in his revelation in that he speaks and acts in the limited created forms that characterize the world of space and time. But he does this without losing himself, without being contained by space, and without being conditioned by time. So while God's revelation is accommodated to the creature in the act of revelation, that act of revelation does not change or limit God himself. God accommodates his revelation to creatures even as that revelation discloses the infinite depth of God's being and knowledge that cannot at any point be exhausted by the creature. Therefore, the mystery of God's revelation lies in the way that the immutable and impassable triune God accommodates to the creature to reveal himself in spatial and temporal forms without at any point being contained by space or limited by time. The limitations that pertain to the accommodated forms of God's revelation do not imply any limitation in God's being or knowledge. It is in that sense that Van Til insists that there can be no self-limitation in God as he reveals himself in anthropomorphic categories taken from the created order. The limitation is found in the forms God appropriates, not in God himself. Everything depends on making and keeping that distinction. Third. In this quote, Van Til speaks of any view that ascribes self-limitation to God himself, therefore confusing God with the forms of revelation that he uses. Van Til speaks of that view as pantheism. A self-limiting God is a pantheistic construction. Van Til does not mean by pantheism the crass doctrine that God and creation are indistinguishable. That's a popular textbook conception of pantheism. Rather, he defines pantheism in precisely the same terms Voss defines pantheism in his Reformed Dogmatics. Voss defines immutability, listen, as that perfection in God whereby he is exalted above all becoming and development, as well as above all diminution, and he remains the same eternally. And in answer to the question why it's necessary to emphasize God's immutability in his relation to creation, Voss in RD 113 says this, it is necessary because pantheism teaches that within God there is development. Indeed, that the development of the world is nothing other than the process by which God comes to self-consciousness. You see, the doctrine of divine immutability, according to both Voss and Van Til, provides the safeguard against all species of pantheism. Pantheism encompasses any view that God limits himself to the mode of creaturely existence and therefore enters into a common time engaged in mutual change along with the creature. If you followed previous modules, pantheism here is a virtual synonym with correlativism and mutualism. In Van Til's vocabulary, pantheism and correlativism mean the same thing. God and man are 
submerged in a common process of mutual development. If God engages in voluntary self-limitation of any sort in relating to creation, Van Til says we have pantheism. Now Van Til notes fourth, that since modernism is ready to enter into the church via the old pantheistic doctrines, that is more the reason not to yield an inch on this point. Do you hear that? The Trojan horse by which error comes into the church through modernism is the old pantheistic doctrines. Schleiermacher, Dorner, Barth, teaching in various ways that God changes in his relation to creation. While each theologian differs in details, all of these modernist or neo-modernist theologians believe that God undergoes some dynamic transmutation in his freely willed relation to creation. As we've talked about both Dorner and Bart in the previous module, feel free to look back on that material. But the point here now as we're advancing is that pantheism is not the heritage uh, heritage of the Augustinian and Calvinist tradition. It belongs to modernism. Pantheism's natural home is modernism, not Augustinian Calvinism, not confessional Reformed orthodoxy. All forms of modernism, remember, affirm these things. A mutable deity, a mechanical history, and an errant Bible. Therefore, Van Til shrewdly, insightfully presents this pantheism, the doctrine that God and man share in a common mode of mutual change in relation to one another, as an instrument in the hands of modernist theologians who seek to enter into the orthodox confessional church and destroy its orthodox doctrine of God. Now this insight, is precisely what makes the emergence of pantheism among two noteworthy students of Van Til's so disturbing. John Frame, in what many would consider uh, one of his um, more valuable works on the doctrine of God, introduces a doctrine that Van Til himself, in IST 200, would term pantheistic. He's explicit, page 572, the doctrine of God, a theology of lordship, that there are, quote, two modes of existence in God. The first is an atemporal mode of existence, and the second is an historical mode of existence. And Frame's central claim is that the historical mode of existence in God, quote, begins with creation itself. God's relation to creation involves a sovereignly willed new mode of existence. And so Frame says, quote, history involves constant change, and so as an agent in history, God himself changes. When God creates, God changes, and a temporal mode of existence arises in addition to his first atemporal mode of existence. This dual modality, timeless and temporal, is a species of dipolar theism that Van Til would call pantheism. Just to remind you, to return to the Van Til quote, if we were to speak of God's limitation, we should speak of a self-limitation, and we would have to begin with his self-limitation at the creation of the world. Pantheism has constantly done this. It could not be clearer. Whether Frame intended to promote what Van Til called pantheism is a question I don't seek to resolve. But the fact stands that he did it. 
frames second mode of existence, the historical mode of existence that emerges in God's relation to creation, directly limits God's immensity and eternity as creator, and in frames view, history constantly changes so that God, as an agent in history, himself changes. Now, in Frame's defense, he never wanted to be called a Vantillian, but said instead he was Vantill's friendliest critic. Made that claim in his 1994 Vantill, an analysis of his thought. So he's at least self-conscious that he's not a full-orbed Vantillian, and I suspect he would readily concede his departure from Van Til on this issue. But a second Vantillian goes several steps further than Frame and not only promotes the same pantheistic doctrine, but stunningly attributes this to Van Til himself. Scott Oliphant, in virtually all of his works, including God with us, Majesty of the Mystery, Reasons for Faith, makes a claim materially identical to Frame's. But most baffling and disturbing is that he makes this error and describes it to Van Til himself in his foreword to Van Til's Common Grace and the Gospel. On pages 21 and 22 of his foreword to Common Grace and the Gospel, he redefines not only Van Til, but the language of voluntary condescension in Westminster Confession 7.1 to support his pantheistic doctrine of God as the Creator. Oliphant proposes that the Son's voluntary assumption of a changeable human nature in the Incarnation provides a governing paradigm for viewing God as assuming changeable covenantal properties in his covenantal condescension to creation. Oliphant says, and I'll give you a fairly lengthy quote, so what does condescension mean? We've heard what Bavink says it means. We've heard what Van Til says it means. What does Dr. Oliphant say it means? The best way to begin to grasp this glorious and gracious truth is to look at the supreme and ultimate example of condescension in Holy Scripture the incarnation of the Son of God. In the incarnation, the second person of the Trinity came down in order to be with us so that he might live an obedient life and die an obedient death on behalf of his people, rise from the dead and ascend into heaven to reign. What did this condescension entail for him? It did not mean that he began to occupy a place he did not otherwise occupy as the Son of God, he was fully and completely God. He was, is, and remains omnipresent. What it means is that the Son of God took on a human nature so that he might fulfill the plan of redemption that was decreed by him together with the Father and the Spirit before the foundation of the world. He took on, in other words, and here's the key, listen, characteristics, properties, and attributes, call them covenantal characteristics, in order that he might relate to us in a way that he did not otherwise. His condescension was his taking on of a human nature in order properly, according to what the triune God had decreed, to relate to creation generally and to his people more specifically. Now here's the, here's the turn. Here's the pantheistic turn. When the conf continuing the quote, when the confession affirms God's voluntary condescension, 7-1, in creation. This, in the main, is what is meant. It means that God took on characteristics, properties, and attributes he did not have to take on. Remember, this condescension was voluntary. In order that he might relate, even bind himself, to the creation and to his creatures. His commitment to that other than himself, his creation included, by definition, a condescension. He bound himself to his creation, including his creatures, such that there would be, from that point into eternity, characteristics, attributes, and properties he would take on all by the sheer freedom of his will. 
That is not a true forward to Van Til's Common Grace in the Gospel. That is the forward to what would be a revised edition of God with us. But that is included as a forward to Van Til's Common Grace in the Gospel. Now, what you have to appreciate, and much more could be said, I'm just giving you the fundamental contours of critique here. When Oliphant proposes that God's covenantal commitment to his creation entails his voluntarily generating and acquiring new so-called covenantal characteristics patterned after the son's assumption of human nature, Oliphant redefines the notion of voluntary condescension in pantheistic terms that are out of accord with the Reformed doctrine of covenant and a Reformed understanding of condescension enshrined in Westminster Confession 7.1, and he's out of accord with what was expounded on this very point by Voss and Van Til. But what does it look like more concretely? That still sounds a little general and abstract. What does it mean more concretely as it pertains to God's self-limitation? And what are some examples of Oliphant's neoteric view, this new view? Oliphant says, still in the foreword, God's voluntary condescension requires that we affirm him to be both independent and in relation to his creation, both immutable and able to move from a disposition of wrath toward a disposition of grace. By God condescending, eternity and time are united as they are in Christ without in any way separating, denying, confusing one side or the other. In voluntary condescension, quote, eternity and time are united in God as they are in Christ. That means that the properties of the eternal God and the properties of the temporal creation are united in God as he relates to creation and in the event of condescension. In the terminal act of incarnation, the Son of God assumes all of the properties of the creature to himself in a hypostatic union. But what Oliphant proposes is that in the prior event of creational condescension, the eternal and temporal properties of God and the creature are already united in God. This union between eternity and time, immutability and mutability, occurs in the event of condescension. And the qualities that God voluntarily assumes and that become attributes of His are the same created qualities that will appear in the humanity of Jesus in the Incarnation. The created qualities are called covenantal qualities. And those are united to the essential qualities that God possesses apart from creation. This means quite clearly that the dynamic involved in the hypostatic union occurs in creation when the eternal and temporal are united in God in voluntary condescension. Nate Shannon, one of Oliphant's disciples, in an article he wrote in March 20 of 2014, says, I have called Oliphant's proposal a Christologic theology proper. Oliphant calls it a Chalcedonian theology proper. I'm just going to add a two-nature theology proper. To lay bare the logic of Chalcedon, as it is leveraged here, to reconstruct the divine attributes leads to what we say is a two-nature theology proper. At core, Oliphant equivocates between the human characteristics, properties, and attributes of Jesus' humanity and the so-called covenantal characteristics, properties, and attributes of God in his creational condescension. 
Ollivant says God assumes such to interact with creature with creatures in time. And the key is that the human attributes of Jesus and the covenantal attributes of God share in the same contingent mode of incremental growth and development through time. The so-called covenantal attributes of God and the so-called covenantal characteristics of Jesus' humanity share the same mode of incremental development over time. And so he says on page 198, using this model, where eternity and time are united in God as distinct attribute sets, he says, to repeat, we may properly speak of God as not knowing and knowing at the same time, of his being limited in space and infinitely omnipresent, of his lacking power to do something and his being omnipotent at the same time, apart from incarnation. God, by the assumption of so-called covenantal properties in his freely willed relation to creation, may be properly characterized as not knowing certain things, limited in space, and lacking the power to do something. God, according to covenantal properties thesis, has voluntarily limited his power, knowledge, and presence. This is precisely what Van Til says leads directly to pantheism in our quote on page 200. But let me be even more concrete. If you want something more concrete and illustrative of what a two-nature theology proper looks like, let me turn you to two other works where Oliphant teaches this pantheistic conception of God's relation to creation. In 2012, in God With Us, he argued that God, due to voluntary self-limitation, does not know the future. Oliphant argues that in his eternal decree and in the work of creation, God takes on properties that entail he has an ignorant and developing covenantal mind. Page 219, note 74. A mind that does not know the future. He says, expanding, page 194, once God condescends in his decree, we should recognize that in taking to himself covenantal properties, he takes to himself as well the kind of knowledge and will, to be discussed later, that accrues to those properties. Or to put it another way, one of the covenantal properties he takes to himself is the development of knowledge that is conducive to his interaction with his creation generally and with his people. Page 194. God's covenantal mind entails divine ignorance in relation to creation. God, in his condescended relation to his people, learns new things. That's what he means on page 198 when he speaks of God not knowing. Now, this book was pulped by the leadership of Westminster Seminary in 2015 so that you cannot find it anymore unless you bought a pre-pulped copy, but I'm quoting from one of those pre-pulped copies. But prior to that, uh, several years before, almost a decade before, in Reasons for Faith, page 234, Oliphant illustrates the function of covenantal properties and has already unveiled the divine ignorance thesis. He speaks of a lack of knowledge in God when God calls out to Adam, where are you? Now we've already seen from Bavink, if you've read my Locating the Mystery, that Bavink said it's absurd to assume God does not know where Adam is hiding. That's Bavink's thesis. But Oliphant says it's not absurd because God has assumed a covenantal mind and doesn't know the future. Instead of that traditional Reformed view you find in Calvin, Boss, Van Til, and Bobbing, Oliphant says this, In condescending to relate to Adam and Eve, he is like them covenantally restricted in his knowledge of where they might be hiding in the garden. Do you hear it? This covenantal restriction is voluntary self-restriction. 
It is voluntary limitation. It is self-limitation in terms of knowledge. Not only does God take a new mode of being that is developing, God takes a new mode of knowledge that is ignorant. As Van Til said, God doesn't take on new properties that, that develop over time, defense of the faith. Oliphant says, yes, he does. Condescension for Oliphant is an event of divine self-limitation that results in divine ignorance. Now, what makes these formulations so dangerous emerges in Van Til's insight that pantheism is a Trojan horse used by modernists to infiltrate Orthodox confessional churches. Often, as you find with Oliphant, he says God generates or wills or assumes these new mutable and composite properties to interact with us, but as he does so, he develops in his being and he grows in his knowledge. Now, what's so fundamentally dangerous and even chilling about Oliphant's advocacy is Oliphant seeks to ascribe this pantheism to the Westminster Confession of Faith and to Van Til himself, which is just stunning because neither has a place for pantheistic self-limitation. The level of confusion here is stunning and disastrous. And it's compounded. In the case of Oliphant, the Trojan horse of pantheism that enables modernism to invade the church is hidden under the name and reputation of Van Til himself. Oliphant has repudiated this work as unhelpful, but he's never come out and publicly said it's heresy. It leads to pantheism. It entails correlativism. It requires mutualism. And we hope that he would repudiate it as the pantheism it is for the sake of Christ and his church, because that forward misleads people to attribute to Van Til the very error of which he was the most robust critic in the 20th century. And so self-limitation of any form leads to pantheism. And pantheism is the Trojan horse that modernists use to bring a false god into the courts of those who confess a self-contained triune god. Fifth, Van Til says flatly, the Bible uses anthropomorphic names of God constantly, but nowhere presents a limited deity. That is a one-sentence critique of Frame's doctrine of God and all of the places where the error of covenantal properties appears in all of it. Anthropomorphic names, anthropomorphic language, everywhere. A limited God, nowhere. The constant and pervasive use of anthropomorphic language does not at any point teach a doctrine of self-limitation. This is Van Til's analog to Bovink's maxim that the Bible's teaching as a whole, including its anthropomorphic language, prohibits ascribing change to God in his pluriform relations to creation. Now, of course, we must affirm, as I already have, that God accommodates his revelation in language and concepts in the created order. That's the whole point of revelation. Of course, revelation is accommodated. But such revelation does not disclose a God who has changed himself or limited himself or undergoes process in his knowledge and development in his being. God's accommodated revelation retains an infinite depth dimension that is inexhaustible by the creature since God uses the limited media of creation to disclose his infinite fullness in a way that no creature can ever comprehend. On this issue, Van Til insists that we must not give an inch lest the Trojan horse of pantheism smuggle into the Orthodox confessional church the different religion of modernism. This five-point summary of Van Til's quote on page 200 provides the frame of reference 
by which we can distinguish the orthodox Van Til from his heirs who have strayed into the path of pantheism and mutualism and have enabled the potential encroachment on true religion among the Orthodox. Now we'll continue to talk a bit more about how fearless anthropomorphism works in relation to creation, but we must maintain militantly. The Bible uses anthropomorphic names of God constantly, but nowhere presents a limited deity. In addition to this, just 10 pages later in the intro to Systematic Theology, Van Til cites directly from Bovink's discussion in Reformed Dogmatics regarding God's immutability and His freely determined relation to creation and Scripture's use of anthropomorphism to portray that relation. This is where much confusion, confusion rests in the work of recent Van Tilians such as Frame and Oliphant, whom we've just surveyed. Van Til clarifies a doctrine of relationality that, if understood, would lay bare the errors of both forms of pantheism in frame and all of it. He says this, quote, Boving points out that the immutability of God has had its enemies. These enemies have been found among those whose thinking has been informed by pagan philosophy such as Heraclitus. Dorner, for instance, sought to harmonize the unchangeability of God with the fact of his active concern for the things of the universe by saying God is immutable merely in the ethical aspect of his being. God is always love and always holy. On the other hand, God changed when he actually created the world and when in the person of the Son he became flesh. Bavink insists, and rightfully so, that all of these efforts are foredoomed to failure. The scriptures speak anthropomorphically of God and could not do otherwise, but for all that God himself is immutable. There is change round about him, there is change in the relation of things to him, but there is no change in God himself in that relation. Now here's what I want you to appreciate. Van Til identifies Dorner's error in that God changes in the relation of creation and changes in the incarnation. Dorner's view is homogenous with the views of Frame and Oliphant. But Van Til, secondly, in order to oppose that pantheistic move you find in Dorner, Frame, and Oliphant, invokes the reform doctrine of relational change. The reform doctrine of relational change. For Van Til and Bovink in the work of creation, the relation can change, the creature in the relation changes, but God himself doesn't change. But the pantheists, whether Dorner, Schleiermacher, Bart, Cobb, Hartshorn, Hegel, Frame, or Oliphant, when they insist um, on change, they insist in what I will call the unholy trinity of a threefold change. The creature and the relation changes, the relation itself changes, and God himself changes in the relation. They want a trifecta of change. But for the Orthodox, there is only a twofold relational change that involves no change in God. The relation itself and the creature changes, God does not. Therefore, when we interpret Van Til's language about God's attitude changing, the language of common grace in the Gospel 73, we must recognize what Van Til says and interpret Van Til in light of Van Til. Here's the quotation. I believe this is the only one that Oliphant has found he tries to leverage to make Van Til a pantheist. Here it is. Van Til says, We are entitled and compelled to use anthropomorphism, not apologetically, but fearlessly. 
We need not fear to say that God's attitude has changed with respect to mankind. We know well enough that God in himself is changeless. But we hold that we are able to affirm our words have meaning for no other reason than we use them analogically. Now, I've interpreted this text fairly extensively in our previous module. I don't want to repeat that lecture, so let me say a few additional things that bring out a point of clarity. First, Van Til strenuously denies Dorner's claim that God changed when he created the world. Second, he strenuously affirms that Scripture portrays God's acts of creation and revelation that proceeds from the mutable realm of the creature. Thus, the work of creation, described in mutable anthropomorphic terms, does not entail the generation of change in God. God did not take on a new property, namely the property of creator, in the new relation to creation. The relation changes, the creation changes, but God does not change. He doesn't add a property, call it the creator property. There's change around him, about him, change in the relation of things to him, but no change in God. And here's the point applied to the attitude of God changing in CGG 73. If God does not change in his relation to creation, he does not change in his relation to sin. In the case of Adam's fall into sin, there is change round about God. The change is introduced by Adam's original sin that breached the covenant of works. Adam himself changed when he lost original righteousness, became guilty of sin, and his entire nature was corrupted by the fall. The fall introduced change in Adam. The fall introduced change round about Adam. The fall introduced change around about God, but there was no change in God. As Van Til says, here it is, God in himself is changeless. He does not limit himself or take on new properties. Van Til is explicit about that. Adam himself changed and Adam's relation changed and God revealed his wrath in history. That historic event brought a change in history that does not entail a change in God. That's the simplest way I know to put it. Changes in history do not occasion analogous changes in God. He doesn't take on new properties as creator or judge. Now, to return to Van Til's quote, Van Til says we're entitled and compelled to use anthropomorphism, not apologetically, but fearlessly. What does fearless anthropomorphism mean? Let me give you a single sentence summary. We, without fear, insist that the immutable triune God, without self-limitation or self-modification, relates in revelation to the world and gives the moment of history and secondary causes authenticity and meaning. And we are fearless in maintaining that. Frame and Oliphant, Dorner and others, advocate what we might call a fearless pantheism. The distinction is that fearless anthropomorphism denies self-revelation in God, but fearless pantheism enshrines self-limitation in God. For frame, the self-limitation is a second mode of existence that involves change in time. For Oliphant, the self-limitation is the assumption of covenantal properties that involves, among other things, an ignorant, developing covenantal mind. But to give one last clarifying comment, Van Til insisted that God must remain who he is and have self-delimited being in 
his relation to creation or we devolve into pantheism. I'm going to read you two quotes and leave them without much comment. Van Til says, Thus we have as Christians a distinct philosophy of history. All that has happened in the past, all that happens in the present, and all that will happen in the future rests for its presupposition upon the self-sufficient internal activity of the self-predicating and therefore non-delimited being. The movements of history are not determinative of the self-sufficient activity of God. When God created the world by the determination of his will, there was no change in himself. When the second person of the Trinity became incarnate, there was no change in God. God gave the world existence alongside himself. He could do so just because he is the self-contained infinite being. Thus, the doctrine of the infinity of God, so far from leading us into pantheism, is the best possible safeguard against it. Any attempt to safeguard the doctrine of God against pantheism by subtracting from the self-contained internal activity of God is foredoomed to failure. And finally, Van Til says this, Accordingly, we begin our thought about the infinity of God by insisting that the fullness of the being of God is back of the active fullness and variety in the spatio-temporal world. Scripture leads us in this respect. It has no hesitation in speaking anthropomorphically of God. It ascribes all manner of activity to him. Of this activity, we cannot otherwise think than spatially and temporally. So we are face to face with the choice of thinking of God as altogether like unto ourselves, pantheism, or of thinking of ourselves as finite analogs of the fullness of his being, anthropomorphism. As we cannot do the first without wiping out the difference between the creator and the creature, we are compelled to do the latter. Intro to Systematic Theology, page 2. In light of this doctrine of fearless anthropomorphism, all progress in theology in general and the common grace issue in particular will see development in a direction that advances rather than destroys the Reformed faith. And so as we think back about the various lectures in this module, we move from an introduction and overview of the basic issues of common grace stepped into Van Til's own doctrine of the non-redemptive witness of the Spirit to natural revelation and the new relation occasioned by Adam's sin. And we parted ways once for all with the older Roman Catholic natural theology. We then considered the concrete line of thinking, the positive line of concrete thinking, and move from the Trinity as a self-contained concrete universal to an all-determining decree to a conditional covenant. And we thought concretely about earlier and later grace and sought to advance the discussion in uh, the topic of common grace using Van Til's insights. And then in this last lecture, we took time to address some of the fundamental problems in contemporary Ventil scholarship where in the name of fearless anthropomorphism, there are those in the name of Ventil, some not in the name of Ventil, but within a Reformed orbit, offering fearless pantheism. This module is a critical module to understand because in it we move more deeply into the triune creator and begin to understand the concrete line of the development of the history of special revelation that gives us further opportunity to develop and clarify these profoundly difficult issues in a way that enshrines the deeper Protestant conception of the creator-creature relation advocated by Voss and expounded and advanced by Cornelius Van Til.